The standard stage two, uh, stage two is, uh, you know, attended, attended prototypical network. I mentioned that the attention is per query support pair. So the actual feature vectors are changing, you know, for every support and every query. It's a nice property. Uh, ob obviously, attention is good, right? M many evidence for that, uh, much evidence for that. And, and finally, uh, what I mentioned is that we have some iterative process, uh, the NMS, the maximal suppression. Uh, which actually can find these matching regions one by one. So you just take the single region it found, you wipe out the maximum hypothesis, you go to the next one. Obviously, if an object is composed from multiple regions which are roughly rigid, but moving independently, they, they hopefully will get matched. So it will grow the mask, you know, on the entire object, or on most part of it, the thing we managed to match. And if there are multiple objects, right? So for, for instance, uh, the support, we do require that there is a single object on the support. Otherwise it's hard to understand which one got matched, right? Uh, but uh, you can't control the shell. What? So, somebody wants to annotate? No, uh, no, uh, nobody. So, somebody asked for annotation. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. we don't see in the chat then. Um... Okay, ne never mind, never mind. That's a feature of uh, WebEx. Maybe somebody is trying the features. So, uh, yeah, so so uh, basically, um, the NMS process wipes out the max hypothesis, reiterates again, you get another back projection for the next part, and so on. If you have multiple objects on query, you can have multiple objects, it will find them one by one. Uh, if they are not too close, it will uh, they will be separated. If they are too close, we'll see that it's a typical failure mode. It will merge them uh, together. So we'll get this step, but it, you won't be able to break it to bounding boxes easily, at least not in this variant of the method. And one last comment on the on the technical part. Everything, including NMS, is end-to-end. -end. It's PyTorch, it's differentiable, and it's quite fast. Okay, we have some measures in the in the in the paper. So so uh, let me you know just to to illustrate the training process. Here I have two episodes. Episodes in future learning are like future tasks, small tasks where you have the query and the support, and you want to you know classify them correctly, and and in this case also localize the object. So the way th these are two episodes from two datasets, Cub and ImageNet LocFS. Right, so the, in the cab we have birds, in the image net we have different animals. In this one, it's not the entire image, it's just the animals. So, uh, um, um, so what we have here on the left is query set, and these are the, the match support. So we have only one shot in this case and five classes. So five support images are repeated here, right? The initial network is random, so you see this mess, that, that's fine. You will see how it develops with training. These are episodes which are not used for training. They are, they are kind of validation, right? But they are same classes. So they are not new classes. They are classes it, it actually encounters. We'll just see how the, the matching capability evolves. And of course, we'll later see some examples of target, you know, test classes matching as well. So, so, so what happens here is unknown to the model, the queries are ordered by class. So every row is the same class. So eventually, when it converges, if the validation succeeds, we want to see the same support image on the entire row because it's the same class. We have just one image per class. Okay, uh, and and obviously, you know, these regions, you know, for, for these two images, let's say it uh, it thinks the random model thinks these two things match. Okay, whatever it is now, and uh, it thinks that this image belongs to this class. And it thinks the objects are here. Okay, but that's a random model. So let, let's start playing. Let's see how it goes. Let's start playing here as well. Do, do you see it play? Like I, I guess it skips some bits, but but you, you should see. Yes, uh, and that's that's fine yeah, to yeah. skip here because it's very dull video. We made it too long. Let me let me do the skipping my, <laughs> myself. So this is just training patches, you know, with training iterations, it's progressing, so it still flickers here, but you can see that. You know, uh, most objects are found. You see this correct classification. Not surprising, there are base classes here, but test images. So validation basically, but you see how it managed to learn to classify. It managed to localize, right? And the different uh, images here, different classes. 
Uh, well, the resolution here is small because you know few shot uh, always we always use the small resolutions. Uh, when we use bigger resolutions, by the way, it's just getting better in terms of uh, results. But, but historically, everyone uses small images. Also, fast to train, fast to test hypothesis, and so on. Uh, anyway, uh, here are some more heat maps for different uh, data sets. Um, not super interesting, I think. Uh, these are heat maps matching, right? Query and support. Well, there, there are some nice examples, surprisingly. Like, like for instance, here it found the rug, right? It matched this piece of a rug here. It doesn't, you know, necessarily matches the scale and uh, and so on. But but here you see this nice localization of the rug under the feet, and uh, there are multiple. So basically, what what happens is after some training, it works, you know, pretty robustly in many many, you know, tests I did. Uh, it works quite nicely, and also, you know, for for more variable locations of the objects, we, we, we'll see we test on Pascal as well. So, 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 uh, you know, as I said, that's the first time somebody tries to approach weakly supervised fusion object detection. So we didn't have any previous publications. We are proposing this task. So we uh, we created a, a very big, you know, set of a large set of um, different baselines. Uh, first of all, there are the upper bounds. So upper bounds are fully supervised visual detectors, basically detectors which are trained using bounding boxes and also see bounding boxes for new classes when they adapt. Okay. For this, we used our own work and, and uh, one of the more recent works, DFA, uh, uh, also state of the art. Uh, we have the future, you know, best future classifiers. That's not the only one. That that's a popular one, MetaOpt, and obviously they cannot localize. But there are kind of standard methods to try to see, you know, where are the objects the classifier, uh, you know, uh, reacted to. So GradCam is one very popular. You probably saw a lot of images of GradCam. Here you see some examples comparing. So in some cases it is the same. Uh, in some cases uh, it's it's rubbish. Uh, so, so GradCam, uh, one method, uh, selective search is another method that's just um, um, some, you know, proposal method which is trained externally on something and then many people use it for many uh, uh, methods. Uh, this is the second baseline, or oh, two more. Then uh, we have uh, one of the popular Weekly supervised detectors, which is not few shots. So this is just a weekly supervised detector. And we adapt it uh, to the new classes by fine tuning. So basically, we get the little data, let's say one example per class or five examples per class, and we just fine tune a little bit. We try, you know, the best possible fine tuning. We really, you know, tried, and the best result we get from this uh, way we, we reported. Uh, we have uh, one of the, the strongest. Attention-based methods uh, for few shot. Attention-based means that it first computes some attention map. It also uses some dense matching, but it has no geometric constraints in this case. It, it's somewhat similar, but it has no geometric constraints. And then uh, we can, you know, obviously we can compare performance and classification, but we can also uh, compare localization because attention is actually a localization. What we produce, so, you know, you can al also call it attention, right? So. Heat map and the heat map, so we can apply all the same metrics to these heat maps, and we did that. And finally, this is kind of a form of ablation. We can, uh, you know, check first of all if you just take a random network. So it's like locality sensitive hashing, right? Like random transformation of the data. Maybe this half transform thing, you know, the matching and everything, that's what does the trick. We maybe we don't need to train at all. Of course, it's not true, but but you know. Somebody might have complained, so we did it. <laughs> oh, I don't remember. Maybe somebody did complain. Anyway, uh, and uh, and uh, finally, uh, we have. Uh, oh, sorry. This was this one, and and this one. That's when we train separately. So we train a classifier, like uh, currently it's by the way one of the standard methods to do few shot. Just train a classifier, and then you know even simple methods sometimes beat the stronger ones. So uh, we just did like that, we trained the, the classifier and then we attached Starnet matching head to it. So basically this thing that does all, all thing I, everything I said. 
just using this as a background, and we also computed this result. So uh, after this long uh, listing of the ba uh, baselines, here are the results. You know, I won't go over all the numbers, obviously. Uh, we did test on three data sets, in the uh, CAR plus CAR. Uh, overall, you know, taking on these two, Darnet is at least 16% better than all the baselines. Um, um, the, uh, the fully supervised fusion detectors, which I said our upper bounds are here and, and, and here. Okay, for Pascal, we have another one. So, because weapon wasn't tested on those. Uh, so, uh, in both cases, we see that the Starnet, if you reduce the requirement for IOU, instead of the standard one, which is, you know, 0 0.5, do 0 0.3, and I'll immediately explain why you can do that. Uh, if you do the 0 0.3 and you compare to the, the upper bound 0 0.5, you get comparable, okay? Or even in this case, slightly higher. And, and why, you know, why it's okay to reduce because, you know, 0 0.3 could be wild, right? But it's not. Actually, we did some verifications in the appendix and you can see some stuff there some additional uh, measurements, and 70% of cases where there is misalignment between the standard bounding box and the, and the, um, uh, uh, and the, the ground rules, they are just like that, like partial detection. So, so in, in this case, uh, you know, somehow the bounding box recovered, but, but in many cases, you'll just get small bounding box here around the, where the heat map really is, and it's just part of the object. So, uh, you know, it's a natural issue with many weekly supervised methods. We suffer from it as well. There are some solutions could be implemented. We didn't do that, but, uh, but, but uh, arguably, you know, if you can localize part of an object, that's also good, right? Like, you know, you know, it's there, you know, it's part, maybe, you know, it's a good start, uh, especially since you just invested one example for it, right, for this class. Uh, here are some examples from Pascal, uh, some earlier cases, like I said, partial detections or grouping of instances of the same class in a single heat map because they are too close. Um, okay, so I don't have time for this paper anymore, so I'll just mention there are some experiments on social classification in the paper. We have some architectural ablations showing, you know, different additions of stages and the NMS and, and what it does on the cab. And we have this analysis I mentioned about the 70%. Uh, you can see all of it in the paper. The code is not yet available because it's not yet really published. It will be soon and the code will be soon. Just, you know, here's the link. There is a readme currently, but there'll be code there. We, we did submit the code with the paper uh, to the conference. And now we'll clean it up and, and put it uh, in the public GitHub after we get some permission from the IP. Takes a little bit of time, but eventually we'll release all the code, so fine. Uh, yeah, and you're all more than welcome to visit us on AAAI, where we'll be presenting this work. Okay, moving to the next talk, uh, next paper. This is called Task Adaptive Features of Swiss Learning. This was published on the CCV20, uh, presented there as well. This is all about leveraging unlabeled data for future, okay? So how can unlabeled data help you short? And, you know, begin again from a little bit afar. So, um, and we did mention it, by the way, from your question. So very insightful. And, uh, and here is a small illustration, which is, you know, very intuitive. Uh, basically the claim here is that uh, one big problem with few shot is, is feature noise. Okay, unrelated features basically. When you train on base classes, let's say these are the base classes, you get out some features. Intuitively, in this case, it could be shape, they could be size, and could be color. And naturally, you know, size, that's the hardest one, right? It won't go for size. Usually it never goes for size. Size is hard to represent even. How would you represent size in, you know, in, in conventional networks? You can, but it's tricky. Uh, and, and in test classes, in this case, only the size actually, you know, works, right? That's what you need. So arguably, if you learn, you know, these three features, and of course you learn many more, right? 
uh, out of this base pre-training, when you go to test, you have some signal. It's buried inside, you know, the feature vector, which is huge. And what you usually do is some kind of nearest neighbor, like prototypical networks and so on. They're all based of nearest neighbor, constant similarity and so on. The signal gets drawn. Oh. Noise. Okay, it's pretty intuitive, I think, right? So here's a simple illustration in, in, in you know, in, in actual experiment. You know, take some uh, data set. I, I think it was mini image net or something. Uh, take the base classes, okay? And then compute mutual information. So in, in this case, I, I think I discretized it. So, so uh, it's kind of discrete mutual information, not the continuous beast. Uh, that's simple to understand. Just compute the, the you know, the entropies and so on. And then you you get you know the, the maximum is one obviously it can be more than one but uh, you know many features have some non negligible information inside them right for the, the train class basically it's an information between every individual entry in the feature vector and the class variable okay now you take the same backbone frozen right go to the test classes and just compute it for the test classes. Okay, so so here it goes to the zero, and naturally, okay, you have some features of information. There are very few, and if you start doing nearest neighbor, you'll get most, you know, mostly you'll drown in noise. Jumping ahead, what Tafso, you know, methods, and here are really really simple approaches we are advocating for. We're just more, mainly illustrating the point, less on the method. Method is very simple here. It's like standard methods. Just understanding this intuition and just acting upon it. So acting upon it will get you a subspace, okay, of features. It's not a strict subspace. It's not just selecting dimensions. It's also rotating and doing different things, combining them together. Eventually, you get some subspace, and uh, you select some of them, and you get this picture. So you recovered nicely some information. Arguably, you know, doing nearest neighbor here will get you much more than than, than here. Okay, so that was the intuition, and and uh, to to complete it, so we actually investigate two types of noise. One was the feature noise, another is the sampling noise. Also very easy to understand. In few shot, you get one example, right? Let's say it's one shot, right? The the most extreme few shot, one example. One example can fall anywhere, right? It can't fall on the edge of the distribution. If you don't know anything else, you can only assume there is a nice Gaussian around it, and that's your class. Okay, but if you do have unlabeled data, maybe you can do something, right? You, you see that actually it's some kind of an outlier, right? Maybe you need to do something. Maybe you can correct it, okay? So both these three, you know, these intuitions, each one of them, eventually gets you half the performance we, we get when combining them together. Okay, so, so I really don't have much technical part on this uh, on this paper. You're more than welcome to, to read the, the things <laughs> we put in the, in the text. Uh, but, but I think understanding what I'm saying, it's more important because the methods are really trivial. So uh, first of all, just to set the stage, when do you have unlabeled data in FewShot? You have two scenarios. One and you will encounter. So if you go into the literature, you encounter those a lot of you know many times and in, 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 in performance tables and so on. There is a transactive scenario, okay, and the semi-supervised scenario. In transactive scenario, you assume the queries arrive in a bulk. So basically you get a set of queries and, and somebody asks, okay, now classify all of them, okay, offline, basically, right? So when it happens, that's called transductive. You need to actually you can actually learn something from the queries and then classify them together in a bulk. Okay? That's transductive. Semi-supervised, you are interested in answering on query by query basis. Okay, for the sake of the you know evaluation, you are not allowed to remember the previous queries. Otherwise, we'll you know have some gradual form of transductive, but we don't want that. We want an estimate how would it work on just a single query, basically. Okay, assuming you don't get anything else, but you have unlabeled data unrelated or related to the task, but 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 not arriving with the query, it's just somebody gives you some data. Okay, the 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 the, the difference is really you know small, but, but just uh, you know some standard words used. So if you are interested, it, it's good to have to be familiar with those. Okay, so so in these both cases, you have unlabeled data, 
And what we do in the method, so we battle, you know, two types of noise, feature noise and sample noise. For feature noise, we just do the simplest thing, right? PCA and ICA, right? Who, who haven't heard about it, right? Everyone knows probably what, what PCA and ICA is. So, so principal component analysis, independent component analysis, right? One is, is great for Gaussianity. The other is great for non-Gaussianity. Basically, we try both. Somehow non-Gaussianity wins, but, <laughs> but not in every case. Uh, so so uh, these are kind of very popular feature dimensionality reduction methods. And we apply them on the, in case of transductive and support and query data, on case of semi-supervised and support and unlabeled data, we get some subspace. For PCA, for instance, it would be just, you know, computing the, the, the dimensions of the PC, the direction of the PCA and uh, keeping some small number with the maximal variance, right? Like the ones that explain most variability. Um, and ICA, you know, that are the most independent uh, dimensions. So uh, after that, you have the reduced uh, space, the subspace. Then you go into some, you know, simple clustering. Uh, we propose two algorithms. Slight modifications, maybe. Uh, I, I wouldn't even call them significant modifications of standard clustering methods. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and each step here gives you half the performance boost, which is really big, it's above 10%. Uh, so, so basically th that's it, right? So for feature noise, you do this dimensionality reduction. For sample noise, do this clustering. Here are the clustering algorithms. I originally thought, you know, for the sake of two hours, I'll get into the details of those. I now propose, I'll just mention the intuition and I'll skip. And I if, good proposition. If, yeah, if, if somebody wants to come back, we'll come back. Okay. Yes, yeah. So, so, um, yeah. While I'm interfering, Leonid, another question. There's always those um, beeps on the WebEx. Yeah, I somebody comes uh, in and out. Uh, I guess that's my fault because I never disable those noises, but uh, I think you have to bear with it because I, I don't want to, you know, play with the configuration of it. Okay. Now. Okay, sorry, I, I'll, I'll look for it later for <laughs> the next occasion. No worries. Uh, <laughs> probably there are some settings so, uh, not to beep every time. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, so, so the, the first algorithm is just uh, a variant of, uh, of soft k-means, right? It's uh, somebody, I think, call it c-means, but, but it's not really c-means or soft k-means. Uh, this is some probabilistic model built on top of k-means. Basically, it softly assigns every query and every support image to all the clusters. And this uh, marginalizes out, you know, the, the, the unknown variables. Basically, which cluster which sample belongs to, marginalizes everything, and then you get the posterior. That, that's kind of the gist of it. Okay, we can get into the details later. They are clearly defined, very simple mathematical trick. The second one is uh, reminiscent of a mean shift. Uh, here it's called minshift propagation because it actually propagates things. So basically, uh, in minshift, right, you have your current, you know, cluster center. You collect some radius, you know, some some neighbors, and then you you shift the the mean, you know, to the new position. Here you do the same, but jointly on multiple clusters. Basically, it starts with the support, classifies the data, decides how many neighbors to take by some 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 parameter here. You know, takes these neighbors uh, neighbors for each of the of the current clusters and basically reclusters, moves the the mean to the new position. Do it sufficiently many times, and we do it quite many times here. I think you get improved uh, improved uh, representatives. You know, using unlabeled data. Okay, so now skipping ahead to the performance, just you know, many many numbers because we compared many many things. The punchline is that we get 10% improvement, okay, uh, using unlabeled data, 10% uh, over not using unlabeled data, and 8% above the transactive same supervised at the time, okay, the state of the art. And uh, I'll actually have the comparison worldwide. It's interesting. Okay, so, uh, you know, current comparison, current, j just today I checked. Uh, okay, so so uh, yeah, so th that's a function here. The, the main interesting thing, as it, as with any very simple method, the main interesting thing in the paper is ablation. And if you are reviewing stuff, you know, and you see a simple method, don't reject it. 
just see what ablation they did. If they did enough ablation, then it's useful sometimes. Okay, uh, well, we actually had no problems with this paper, accepted straight away with flying colors. Uh, so, uh, ablation study, right? So, uh, some simple, you know, things to check. Obviously, if you are transactive, you want to, to see how well you will improve with adding more queries and, you know, in, 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 in every method, right? Like, uh, in the you know in the in the baseline, which is state of the art futures classifier that doesn't leverage unlabeled data, it doesn't change much as expected. Uh, if you do some tricks to try to you know stabilize or use unlabeled data to stabilize the pro the prototypes and so on, you you do some gains here at the beginning, but then you add more queries. Actually, it behaves the opposite of what you would expect. And then all these are tafsil, basically different variants, just ICA, right? That's ICA and uh, the Bayesian k-means, and that's uh, ICA and MSP, right? And uh, the same picture repeats on the other data set. Uh, the, these are two very popular data sets for future, mean and tier image um, okay. Okay, see. So, so actually, tier image net, just to mention here, it's quite interesting. The mini ImageNet are just random classes, random hundred classes from ImageNet. Here, the ImageNet are not random classes. First of all, there are much more classes, I think about 400. Second, they split the classes in a way that the train classes and the test classes come from different branches in the world in tree. Basically, they are different. You know, in terms of appearance, they are more different than in the mini. But if you just look at the numbers here, you'll see the x-axis here is actually higher, right? Like they are, they are scaled these two graphs, but here you know it's eighty five. Here it's eighty, right? So so you say, what the hell? This is the hardware data set, right? Why? <laughs> and that's what I mentioned before. That's actually an evidence that more classes in training gives you better performance in future. And 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 that's true. I mean, in tier the, the 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 test classes are more difficult, but there are much more classes than base, much more base classes to learn from. Okay, much much more. And uh, so in measurement, it's 60. Here, it's a few hundreds, right? And, and that's a big boost. Okay, so despite the hardness, you get the boost for, from this one. Okay. Uh, robustness to unlabeled data noise, definitely, you know, uh, important because uh, if you have semi-supervised case, right? Like query, okay, also can be open set, but let's say open set means that you are getting queries which are unrelated to the task. like. You know, you get ImageNet classifier gets images out of ImageNet classes with the hope that it gets you zero score and everything. Never happens because it's a softmax, right? But <laughs> but maybe it's uniform and everything, right? So so it's like close to zero. But it never happens as well, right? There's a big problem. Open set is a big problem. Anyway, uh, but but in semi supervised also in transactive in what I mentioned, unlabeled noise uh, is is an important issue. And you can see that we are more robust than, than uh, you know, different uh, competition. Here are also the sort of state of that method that reported LST, TPN. They reported this, uh, you know, uh, and, and we repeated um, the experiment. So uh, that's another point. The parameter, right? So we do dimensionality reduction. Uh, so how robust is that, right? So definitely we do it on validation. But, but uh, you know, you, you want to know if validation tests they 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 you know react the same and the same number. Here's interesting actually. It, you, you see validation here is blue, I think, right? Yeah, and test is red. So sometimes validation is uh, is easier than the the test. Sometimes it's actually harder than the test. You know, you can you cannot guess that. There's different classes, right? So it could be that way or other way. In two dimension net, validation is more hard. But 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 still, you see that this peak number is ten. Right here and here, validation test. Never mind data set. Never mind. I think it's related to the number of classes, but we didn't test it, you know, thoroughly. That's one of the points for future work to examine. You know, this is kind of quite a surprising fact, right? It's very robust. Like it's it's you know, for five classes in the task, you need ten dimensions. <laughs> uh, so interesting. Okay. Uh, another thing we tried was uh, class Q. Actually, never, no one before us tried class Q because uh, if you you know read carefully all these papers on few shot 
with unlabeled data and you know, transactive semi supervised fish shot, you'll see that, uh, you know, they just sample equal number, right, for each class, equal number of examples, equal number of unlabeled data. Everything is like nice and equal. Obviously, it's unnatural, right? You, you will never get equal sampling in real life, right? Because, you know, to do that, you need the labels, which you don't have, like for unlabeled data. So, uh, so, so we are actually pretty robust, right, uh, to skew. Uh, all of those are us. Nobody else reported that. You know, the simple, the sub, they are just, you know, basically future baseline. It's not, it's not, it's not doing anything. Uh, so, uh, so you see, it's surprisingly robust. You, you can get to really, you know, in the paper, you see the definition of this factor. But uh, you know, even with really large skew, you only lose, I don't know what, 1%, 1.5%. Okay. And uh, obviously we try different backbones and we do better than whatever competition on multiple backbones. You know, the, 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 the methods work. It's not related to the backbone. Um, okay. I'll skip the future work. It's not that interesting. Uh, you can see it also in the paper. Now, you know, the code, it's out. You can take it. That's the link. Um, now the leaderboard. So this was at the time of IMVC. We were the best in the world, according to this leaderboard, which I think is it's quite extensive because, you know, it has all the, the recent papers uh, from the recent conferences. Uh, this was after, right after the ECCV, so uh, here is ECCV, and uh, and also actually right after CVPR, uh, but not everything I think from CVPR went in. Uh, anyway, uh, we were the best here, and then uh, sometimes I don't remember when. This was a few months ago when I did the MVC talk. Uh, my student said he wanted to to do it for something, you know, to use this for some idea we have. And then he said, yeah, I looked at the, at the, at the performance tables and uh, I saw some method which is better. I'll, I'll use that, not tough. So I said, okay, I mean, uh, you obviously you looked, I didn't. So you know what you're talking about. So today I looked <laughs> and actually, I mean, probably he made some mistake. We are still on the top. Uh, so there are actually, you know, current result. Uh, I think he referred to this team thing. So I think it won by a little bit somewhere on transactive um, over the, yeah, transactive, but semi-supervised were still uh, better. Uh, and there are two teams here, I don't know what's the difference. Ah, different backbones, okay. So so never mind, uh, but, but on uh, on tiered image net, we are even better. That's a more important data set, I think. Anyway, just to convince you, uh, that's top-notch method. Do try it. <laughs> Okay, so in five remaining minutes, I think, uh, I'll briefly, you know, go over this one. This is more of um, um, a study, you know, kind of like, I don't know how to call it. It's investigation into, you know, some, some, something related to cross-domain. Uh, we are proposing some benchmark here, which is becoming recently quite popular. We had a workshop on it and many people submitted. And I think, you know, many people are citing it you know, and starring the, the, the Git for the benchmark. So uh, it's really getting traction. We have plans to extend it and so on and so forth. And it was a paper on uh, ACCV20. And so it's called Broader Study of Course Domains Visual Learning. Uh, so just, you know, I think we mentioned this uh, before, so it's, it's not new to you. So, uh, you know, in, in, in typical future learning literature, you have base classes and then you have, you know, novel classes. And it's a bit contrived, right? So novel classes can actually also be dogs. Well, you see dogs in, in base classes, although the, these are different dogs. So this is gazelle hound, this is golden retriever, arguably not the same dog, so a new class. But uh, obviously it's not always the situation and uh, you know, in tier dimension it doesn't happen like that. So it's not, it's not a real thing. But uh, the real thing is that uh, you know, hardly anyone considers you know, going from things like that to things like this. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. And, and, and that's arguably very important, right? You we want to, you know, detect diseases, especially things like melanoma, with few examples. 
but we don't have necessarily, you know, a lot of annotated data for, you know, for, for, for melanoma type cancers, right? Uh, we have some unlabeled data for skin, skin uh, lesions, but, uh, you know, this quality data is, is, is more hard to find. And going from here to here is difficult. Okay, and uh, we'll see how much difficult in a moment. Uh, so in the past, people have considered, you know, not so long past, but uh, still, th this was, th this paper is very popular. So close to visual learning, many people looked at visual learning, saw this paper, they have nice code. And many, uh, you know, papers based on their code as well. Uh, so uh, they they actually proposed this minimization to cab kind of cross-domain thing, which was repeated later in many works. Like this is the cross-domain test, but arguably, you know, minimization has birds. This is bird species. All natural images, not so much of a cross-domain here. I would say there is the metadata set. Uh, also, you know different kinds of natural things. Well, there are some textures here, but obviously natural textures, and there is an omniglot, but most of them are kind of natural image categories, data sets. What we propose to do is actually, you know, we, we fix the starting point, uh, mini image net or image net, and then we, you know, going away from the image net and in, in gradual fashion. So. First, we have things like crop disease, right? So, which is, well, they are natural images, but, uh, you know, you lose the perspective. You have perspective, sorry. Uh, you have color, but, you know, they are kind of flat and, you know, uh, untypical for these kind of classes. Then you have the, the satellite imagery, no perspective, still color, still natural. Then uh, you have the medical images, which have no perspective, like skin lesions. Still color, and then the chest X-rays, which is the most extreme case. Right? So this is really far away. Um, yeah. So so uh, what's a surprise? Here? So here here, is some, here are some surprises. So here is a, a diagram. So what what let's see. So we have here a number of shots, which varies from five twenty to fifty. Basically, that's how many examples you have per class, right? So you have in all these cases, I don't think there are, um, I think th these are all classes. So, so there are no ways here, not sure I need to check. Uh, I think th th these are all classes. So th there's just a number of examples per class, but we are using all the test classes uh, in the test together, not, not, not splitting it into, you know, subsets of classes. Like I, I didn't, actually, I didn't cover all this standard future terminology. Just uh, I, I didn't feel like I had to, but uh, in the few shots, you have the shots, the number of examples per class, you have the ways, number of classes you're uh, simultaneously considering. Here, I think the ways are all the classes, all the test classes. There are no, uh, you know, episodes split by random subset. How yeah. many test class, how many test classes are these? Well, it's different for every data set here. I don't remember the numbers. You, you need to go to the, so everything is documented on the Git. There's a Git for running the evaluation. If you have an algorithm, you can plug it in and, and then, you know, it'll give you some numbers. But, but just output. for order of magnitude, is it like five, 10, 20, 100? Uh... I really don't know, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, but it doesn't matter. I mean, I mean the, the surprising thing here is, you know, every all the methods, that they are working on the same data, basically. So, so relatively, that's fair comparison, right? So, what you see here, this is a random, just a random initialized network, and then you fine tune, right? You fine tune the random network to your small data. So, this fine tuning random network sometimes, you know, does much better job than you know strong algorithms like you know matching net or comparable to protonet, right? For training, uh, or you have the meta opt. Right, meta opt here. That's the blue one, almost like random. It's. I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding. If it's random, how is it better than a trained uh, network? Well, again, so so it trained on that, but then it went and tried to 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 adapt to that. Yeah. Okay, so when you adapt to that, all this training on that is is maybe pointless. Maybe it's better just to train, you know, for random, just on that. Uh -huh. Okay, when it okay. adapts, it fine tunes, right? 
so 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 yes so basically meta learning loses to simple fine tuning okay another but, remark here if this is 50 percent accuracy on random this means that there are just two classes no no you can have 50 percent for a thousand classes that's great actually <laughs> No, but if we're saying it's a randomly uh, trained, it's not a trained no, network. No, no. Again, the initialization is random. So, so uh, what I'm talking about, the random or, or meta learn or whatever, that's just the base training, right? Like what you get to adapt from, right? Okay. You adapt, but when you adapt, you fine tune, you train on ah. five examples per class. And, and okay. if there are 100 classes, and there are a lot of classes sometimes, these five examples are 500 images. Yeah. Okay. No. It's not that small. Mm -hmm. right? Actually, it's an important point about this venture. Uh, it's not that small. Mm -hmm. And actually, what I said before helps. So these numbers are really not, you know, too bad, right? I mean, they're not too bad numbers. If you have 100 classes and, I don't know, 70% performance, that's not bad. And why, why, why it is, you know, higher than what you might have expected? First of all, there are some samples, like 20 or 5 or whatever, but there are a lot of classes, right? So what I said before, the many classes are important. That's another confirmation, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have, by the way, we have another question from, from Eyal Gross. Um, how is perspective defined when you spoke about perspective images? Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, when you are sufficiently far away, everything is flat. Mm -hmm. Is it is it well enough a definition? <laughs> uh, if if this is the definition, then yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes that, that thought, I mean, it's it's just uh, hand waving here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. So, so basically, you know, you you could choose anything, but but uh, you know, the, these things are illustrative enough, and we plan to extend it. You know, we we, we did extend it. We will extend it more to you know more and more data sets entering the fray here. And participating, and, and there's interest. So I think it will grow, and you know maybe you know working on that. And there are papers actually getting out that that use that as as their test, right? So you, let's say you want to attack the cross domain, you know consider that. I mean that's a commercial. So <laughs> uh, and, and 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 so many people do right. Right? There's a competition. There are numbers. There, there's a performance table. So, uh, and, and, you know, we, we set the stage for you, right? Like we have the, the code, you don't need to plug in something, uh, hopefully. <laughs> or you can complain if it's not plugging in well enough. Uh, so, um, yes, so, so fine tuning beats meta learning. Uh, SOTA cross domain methods many times fail. You know, the, the ones that were SOTA on, on these kind of things. And uh, and uh, what we found to help a little bit, that's no, not like a very huge result, but there are small differences here. You can see that, but more than chance. Uh, then it's multi-source transfer and assembling and uh, unlabeled data. Uh, this, this is not using Tafsil. Actually, it's interesting to try Tafsil here. We didn't yet. Um, but uh, uh, even you know simple uses of transactive learning, and you know what's the simplest transactive learning? Just to release your batch norm, like free the batch norm, <laughs> and yeah. put it on uh, put it on uh, train mode during evaluation. You will get nice boost <laughs> because it starts learning from the test. It starts learning from the test and starts you know uh, you know. Ah. No, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a common mistake. You had a breakthrough in performance. You got three percent more. Test your batch now. That's interesting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, we stepped on that. Uh, how do you call it? The thing that you step on it and gives you um, on the nose. I remember how it's called in Russian. A uh, uh, broom. Broom. No, that's the broom. Venik. Grab. No, ah, uh, ah, the, uh, the... For, for, the fork. A fork, it's called, where you go on the field and you and you and you it's, move the earth. I don't think it's called a fork, but but we can. That's what I know. Vili, vili, fork, but it's not. It's okay. Gravely. Okay. Try it later. But we know it's the cartoon when you go, it hits your head. Yeah. 
<laughs> your head. <laughs> okay, so okay, we lost someone. Sorry about the Russian. So uh, um, okay, so I'm actually very close to finish here. So how to do better? Like I said, uh, more models to transfer from multi-source transfer or basically ensembles, uh, that, which is natural and uh, unlabeled data will help. Uh, like I said, that's the, our recipe for the multi-source transfer. It's a pretty simple, you know, kind of transfer. It's a greedy approach. Uh, you take a gap on some layers of your network and multiple depth. Right, you get a feature vector. Basically, you, you apply, gap is global average pooling, right? You apply it on a feature map, you get a vector, right? You just average on the spatial dimensions. Uh, after that, there is some small um, adapter, right? Like some fully connected or whatever. And then a uh, one on convolution, it's just the same. Uh, and then uh, you have some greedy selection. Basically, it tries on some validation set, it basically splits your small data to validation set and, and, and multiple validation sets, cross validation, right? Try different combination of these feature vectors from different depths, selects greedily, and, and runs the test. Uh, it gives you some boost. Maybe you can see it here. I think that's a gray one. So it's better than naive ensemble, it's better than transductive, which is also cheating, like I said. Uh, and yeah, I can finish last. So you get this boost. I don't know how much is it. Three percent. Yeah, that's it. about three percent. Okay. Uh, yeah. So so I think I I, I gave all the punchlines before. So uh, code is available. Like I said, let me stop here. That's a summary. So I cover the Starnet, Tafsil, Cross Domain, Few Shot. Uh, we have the, the codes for two, the code for sound is coming soon. Uh, we also have other papers which I didn't cover that P Peter originally asked for, uh, but they were covered on uh, HTVI and you know, papers on the web. Uh, so thank you all for your attention. Sorry for all the technical issues with the you know, equipment. <laughs> I don't know what's causing them. I blame Zoom. Uh, you know, at least we, we did manage to finish it on WebEx well enough. Uh, yeah. So thank you. If you have any more questions, I'll be happy to answer. Sorry for, yeah, it's about two hours, Peter. You were right. Wow, but we had a very big gap. This <laughs> yeah. was a very so unusual and first time ever. Minutes. So one hour and 20 minutes. That's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you very much, guys. Okay. I have questions a little before I say thank you. I actually have questions uh, and, then, and then I will close off. Uh, uh, so, it, for me, it was just a bit hard following everything, so I'll try to ask about what I could follow. Uh, Starnet, um, training time, how long did it take uh, and, and on what the machines? Uh, yes, so uh, in terms of machines, uh, I think uh, uh, we didn't have too much V100s uh, at the time, so K80. That's what, uh, what we used mostly, uh, although when we Got a grab of 300, we use that as well. In terms of, so it, it, I, I don't think it's much use to just say numbers, uh, but yes, it's fast. And just comparably, anyone who knows MetaOpt, it's it's the same speed, basically. It may be even a little bit faster because we don't have this convex optimization. In the what, what is the speed? Yeah, same as MetaOpt. It's what built is... of MetaOpt code. And MetaOps speed, what is it on, a, let's say, one GPU K80? Uh, Training I time. think it was something like 10 milliseconds per image, something like that. Uh, you know, but it's, you know, it's useless because that it's per image, but it's inside episodes and so on. Usually, it, 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 uh, you know, you, you train one day and, and you get, you know, a sufficient number of epochs. Uh, uh, so with, within one day, let's say on the K80. So on the V100, this would be uh, let's say ten hours around. Yeah, on V100, it's much faster. It's like five times faster, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the reason I'm asking is when we're not working in, as part of like a big research group or a facility, we usually these are the places where we get stuck on. Uh, as somebody who's doing this at home, and, and some of the audience, here yeah, you you can do it at home. Your K80 is something which is less good than your average home gaming, you know. No, I use V100. I use Google Cloud V100s when I train, but still, it's always interesting to understand 
That, that's how much you are rich, but but at my oh. home, <laughs> because... I have I have Nvidia nine hundred and seven. I wish I was rich. I wish I could do that because I'm rich, you know. But no, because we when we're doing a project or research, and it's that by ourselves, we need to take into account how much resources we will require. Sometimes it's easier just to run on your machine. In yeah, your yeah, case, yeah. it's possible. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, K80 is slower than uh, than uh, 48. Uh, you know, your old you know, previous gaming GPU. Now I don't remember. Now it's 280, 248, right? I don't remember. I don't know. I don't, don't, know. I don't remember this. <laughs> um, another question, and, and for me, this is, will be the last one. We we covered a lot, so this question is very broad. It's for you to choose how to answer. But um, what was a hard challenge? um you you tackled um and you were able to solve like the hardest one that you were able to solve creatively during the research processes there are three papers that you actually have five right so like one specific challenge that was tough and took you a while and you were able to solve it in a creative way yeah, i feel i feel like i'm a job interview uh is it uh you you mean this year like five five are this year okay. so you meant this year <laughs> whatever you remember yeah because again there's a couple of papers here so it's hard for me to focus on one um and not, not because of an interview but because it's interesting again for us um to see your your research process and to learn from it for us as well you see so like uh, for example yeah, you mentioned you were the first I benchmark i understand better the question so you want yeah. to learn about the research process like how to make papers uh, I don't have a good answer for that. So uh, I think uh, you know the best thing uh, you could uh, I, I could you know give as an advice mm -hmm. is uh, you know don't be afraid to try the ideas. That's one thing. The other thing you really need to try them fast. If it happens so and for fast, use all the tricks possible. So what's the best trick? Start from somebody else's code. Like, you know, you have an idea, try to find the closest code possible, right? Even if later you'll have to do a hard time to, you know, to explain your novelty, like, because you really change two lines, but <laughs> it kind of gives you 10%. Uh, uh, so you'll struggle with that, but, you know, there are always solutions. Oh, just ask me, I'll find you how to pick out the novelty. No, no problem. I do it all the time for many yeah. people. So, so, so uh, I also review a lot. So, you know, and I'm a hard time. For, you know, I do give hard time sometimes to people, mm -hmm. but I also get a lot of hard time from other people. So it's it's really fair. Uh, they they really taught me to be to be like that. I'm just kidding. I'm I'm, I'm a really nice guy. So mm -hmm. so uh, so basically, you know, you really need to not to be afraid. You know, think about crazy ideas. You know, combine all the new sick ideas in different domains. These things were successful a lot. Don't hesitate to try them. Try them fast. And, you know, if you learn not from me, but from, like, guys like Kaiming Hair, think about simple things. You know, just look at it. So that's not actually my personal. So I wish I could be as productive as him. Yeah. <laughs> I have a long way. But if you just analyze what the guy does, you know, really, you know, he started very, very simple, like this dark channel prior paper, his first oral, his PhD, whatever. Uh, and he's there since, like all these tricks that he's, you know, putting out are super simple, very elegant, do great progress. I mean, really kick, kick, kick forward the, you know, the, the on, not, you know, the, the, the set of that and the competition. <laughs> So, Can you give us an example in your research where you had like a simple, simple yet effective idea, and you had the chance to test it out fast? Something. Oh, uh, Ta Taf Tafsel is a great example. Ta Tafsel uh, was, you know, a couple of months. I don't know, and and you know, the main work was just one month, maybe a few weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it it showed nice boosts, and we built on it. We eventually we we started getting boosts. Then we we you know realized there was some bug or whatever it, it got down again. Then we fixed the bug, you know, we understood how to fix the thing, and got the boost again. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, eventually, you know, we 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 are on top of the table so far. <laughs> well, you know, those are really simple tricks we are advocating for, so anybody can take them and you know. Better ideas could be just, you know, put it in the training, not just do it externally like we do 
Uh, many, many things are possible to extend it. It definitely will not last for long, but I think it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good example. Cool. And, uh, I think Starnet is easy, actually. Uh, I, all my PhD was around this kind of star, half, half, half transform voting methods. I really mm -hmm. like them. I used to do them a lot, you know, for, for my main practice in the, in the industry. They, yeah. they solved me many problems, but then they kind of died down because all this deep learning came in and so on. And for me, it's like a marriage of all the new. I like it really much. <laughs> this is good you're saying, because this was exactly my next question. What was the idea? How did you get the idea for Starnet? Oh, I did many, you know, uh, my history with, I, I'm like the Jonas Half Transform guy. Everywhere I come in, I just put some, uh, well, I used to put some, uh, you know, FLAN or whatever, sub sublinear nearest neighbor algorithm and, and, you know, put some features in and do non parametric model based on uh, Jonas Half Transform. You know, basically it's naive base. So the yeah. basic model behind it is naive base. And it's a very strong algorithm, <laughs> actually. And you can, you know, like mean field approximations, things like that, they have strong theoretical background. They they all, you know, are from the same family. These are, you know, strong methods, non-parametric methods. Uh, they can trade off you, you know, speed for uh, performance, uh, memory for performance. You can have these nice trade-offs. And you can marry it with the, you know, using Starnet like tricks, you can marry it with the modern methods as well. Uh, so I like them very much. Um, yeah, so, so we have some nice new work we are awaiting for uh, answers from CVPR. Uh, if, it, if it's good, I'll be happy to tell about it. Also straightforward and simple and nice and, and gives you nice results. Um, so for sure, if you have the published work and you would like to talk about it, then we'll have we'll love to have you over. Next time we'll do it much more. Uh, you yeah, know, it's an archive. Uh, you you can find it on archive. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation. Like uh, when I have the next. Got to go. I also have to go. <laughs> Johnny, thank you for for the advice. Thank you for teaching us. Uh, thank you for uh, bearing with us also with all the technical no. technical difficulties. More than welcome. Good yeah, I'll, send remark... huh? yeah. I'll send you the recording later. Yeah, thank you. A good remark you had, a couple of remarks is sometimes it's good to keep it simple and sometimes uh, a working trick will keep on working on different on different developments of the technology or the ideas. You just need to be aware enough and to have the confidence enough to say, ah, let's try this and, and have a fast iteration um, of trying in research and also in, when you're doing a product, when you're developing something which is not only new research, but just something new that you want to check it out is gonna work. Fast iterations and keeping it simple. That's also what I like to do many times. Um, thank you everybody who's still here. I don't know if people are still here. Yeah, thank you everybody who's still here. Thank you for joining. Um, and this will be recorded and posted and I will have everything on the newsletter, which you already had references to. And Lonit, thank you again for, for coming and teaching us and, and sharing of your knowledge and your experience. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Happy to be here. Uh, by the way, when you when you post it, can you delete the, the technical issue thing? Just of course. <laughs> I, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have, well, we you, to I have work to do now, basically. A waste of time. It will have yeah. to thing. We okay. created a lot of work for me, but that's okay. No worries. I'm really sorry about it. <laughs> no worries. It's, it's good. not my fault. I mean, I didn't... It's nobody's. That's life. It's okay. okay. <laughs> yes. yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.